Uh, to begin with, I'm a television engineer by degree. Uh, after World War II, I was lucky to be able to go to school on the GI Bill of Rights, became a TV engineer, so I know all about receivers, I know all about studio equipment, and the stuff has been percolating up in my head when I worked for Sanders for about 15 years, because Sanders had absolutely nothing to do with, uh, uh, with uh, commercial analog television. Uh, I ran a division of about 150, 200, 250 engineers in Texas at the time, so I could put somebody in a room and say, here's what I want you to do. Uh, and out of it came the first, then the second of two uh, early chassis with which we played a simple chase game of two spots on the screen. Management got into the act at that point and we had to own, own up to what it was doing. Uh, I'd done it on the QT before because it didn't even rebel my overhead. I had $10 million directly of a payroll, so putting one guy on a bench didn't amount to anything. Uh, and it went on from there. And by the time we got to number seven, the so-called brown box, we had ping pong, handball, volleyball, chase games, light gun games, the, the whole bunch of them. We knew we had something. And the question was, now that we've got it, what do we do with it? Uh, because there's absolutely zero experience on part of anybody, including me, about uh, bringing uh, commercial or especially uh, consumer products into existence. Uh, distribute them, advertise, distribute, market, uh, totally strange. So we had to have a licensee. In 67, we had uh, all the TV manufacturers come in, uh, and those of you old enough will remember that we actually built TV sets in this country, uh, like Philco, RCA, GE, Motorola, yeah, dozens of them. Uh, they all came through Nashua, they all looked at the game, they all said, gee, this is great, and none of them moved off a dime except RCA. When they got through negotiating with us, it was so onerous, we told them to go, you know, take a walk. Uh, fortunately for us, one of the TV, one of the uh, VPs at RCA left and uh, started the Magnavox. He became their VP for marketing in the New York office. He was so impressed with what he saw. He talked to the guys back in Fort Wayne at the headquarters, Magnavox, where all their television sets are designed. They built in Tennessee at the time. Uh, and he said, you got to see this stuff again. So we pack up our goodies, we go to Fort Wayne and demonstrate, and one guy there, the, the guy in charge, uh, uh, said it's a go, just like that. One guy with, with foresight and with uh, imagination, everybody else sitting around the board table there, they're not like, like this, you know, I didn't attempt, uh, dare to commit themselves, but uh, we, um, it took the marketers, it took the, uh, the lawyers about a year and a half to write the contract, but this time it's awfully late to get the thing, uh, the product to market by 1972, which was their objective. So the engineers had all of about nine months to re-engineer what we had. So what did they do? They copied what we had. Out came the Odyssey game, 1972, which took a lot of flack from the technical community because looking inside, it was like looking at uh, a museum piece, <laughs> the way electronics moves you know, over a period of six or seven years. But it worked and it played all those neat games. And within two and a half years, sold about uh, uh, 350,000 pieces, which wasn't bad for a product that nobody even heard of before and gave people that feeling of empowerment that they could actually do something live on the television set, which was great. Yeah.